Good morning, and welcome to Talk of the Town on 99.7, 1450WHTC, and WHTC.com. And we welcome you to Talk of the Town for this Monday, August 17th. I'm Gary Stevens. Peg McMichael is back after some time off, and she'll be joining us with news at the top of the next couple of hours. We'll also have Patty Vandenberg in about an hour with what's new around Howland. Some open line following the 11 and 10 o'clock news blocks, or actually the 11 and 10 if you want to go chronologically. We'll have the two men who represent the Lake Shore on, in the State Senate on Talk of the Town on this third Monday of the month. In about an hour, we'll chat with Roger Victory of Hudsonville. But now, on the other side of our Zoom connection, we are joined by State Senator Eric Nesbitt, the first-term Republican from Lawton. And Eric joins us this morning. Eric, good morning, and welcome back to Talk at the Town. Good morning. Uh, good to good to see you again, Gary. Uh, good to be seen, a as they say. <laughs> yeah. so, sounds like we have a little better connection than we had a month ago. So yeah, that's, a little bit, that's a good little, way to start out. A little bit warbly on that, so we're glad <laughs> to have that as well. And uh, if you want to chat with Eric, no, I'm not going to give you the password for Zoom. We 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 let you t we let you call us at three nine five fourteen fifty, and he'll be happy to chat with us on the WHTC Talk of the Town program. We'll begin first with uh, what I will read from the wire service and then get your thoughts on this. In a rare Saturday session, the Michigan Senate has approved legislation for the start of the school year, including having 75% of funding based on the last school year's count and 25% based on this year. Without that change, districts may be in trouble due to kids opting for virtual learning. Districts will also have to tell the Department of Education if classes are in person, online, or done with a hybrid approach. Uh, again, you and other senators had to do some work on Saturday on this particular matter. Your thoughts about this, uh, shall we say, deal made between legislative leaders and the Whitmer administration? Uh, I'm glad that uh, the uh, the governor didn't just ignore the the legislature and just go it alone like she's done with so many other of these orders over the last few months. Uh, this deal, I think both sides gave a a little bit. Uh, this is something that the House passed back in June. We had several committee hearings on in the uh, in the Senate. And I think, I hope we can all agree that education isn't and, and shouldn't be a partisan uh, issue. Republicans and Democrats recognize the challenge that, that teaching this fall and are empowering schools to make decisions in the best interest of the students. This is really working to uh, provide uh, guidelines, kind of bumpers, if you will, uh, for local school districts to then make the decisions locally on what really fits the needs of, of their students. And uh, this will provide a, a bit more predictability as we know that uh, COVID-19 has impacted different parts of the state differently. Uh, local schools are in the best decision to decide what form of learning is appropriate for their their own individual districts? Uh, you know, uh, Hamilton is very different than Birmingham, and Detroit's very different than than Pawpaw. And so, instead of a one size fits all approach, each district will uh, consult with their local health departments throughout the school year to determine the best and safest form of learning, uh, whether it's in person, distance learning, or or a hybrid of of both. Uh, some. Uh, whether it's uh, teachers or students that are immune compromised, it may be best to do it online. Those that uh, um, are, are are healthy and, and younger, you know, let's let's get back to, to school. Let's uh, uh, encourage the proper protocols. And uh, this bill, these bills, uh, give districts flexibility on the total number of instructional days and hours, as long as the full year's worth of instruction is is provided. Uh, regardless of how they're participating in the school this fall, students need personal attention from their teachers, and these bills do require regular two-way interaction between teachers and students. It sets the guidelines uh, for those that decide not to uh, um, be in person, but do it either virtually or through a hybrid uh, system. So I think to be successful, schools need to know how much funding to expect from the state to provide financial stability and predictability. State funding will be determined largely by last year's student count, but there will be some that will uh, percentage will be determined by this upcoming uh, counts will be used for existing uh, cyber school methods to ensure every student learning remotely is, is counted. 
And I think to better understand the needs of each student during this unprecedented time, benchmark testing will be conducted in the classroom or online. Test results will be shared with parents so they understand their child's learning needs and they will be used for each school district to establish academic uh, goals. Uh, this is something where I think there's a large variability in terms of how much education uh, was actually done over the last five months. Some schools really handled it and tackled it very well. Other schools were caught flat-footed. And, uh, and so this will provide some guidelines for uh, parents, families, students, and school districts to let's get back to learning. I, we reported on Friday that there was the uh, agreement between the Whitmer administration and the legislative leaders from both sides of the aisle in both chambers. Were you, I don't know if you were personally involved with it or you had a chance to maybe talk to uh, 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 the, the, this, the uh, Senate leader and uh, some of the leadership team uh, uh, to, about this particular agreement and whether or not it may be seem, seeming a, a thaw from the Whitmer administration in dealing with the legislature? Um, so Senator Tice, who chairs the Education and Career Readiness Committee, uh, really took the, the lead uh, from the Senate side. It didn't have everything she wanted, uh, didn't have anything that the governor wanted. It was it, it pushed, I think, both sides to kind of that, that point. It kind of reminded me a little bit of the, uh, uh, the auto insurance reform from about a year, year and a half ago. I'm not, you know, it always gives us a little, little hope, but still the communications with her executive orders, with the economic suppression, uh, with their continued uh, um, one-person rule on, on so much of the, the response to the COVID-19 uh, crisis and, and pandemic, um, that it, it appears she didn't want to go it alone on, on education 100%. Uh, it, and instead wanted to provide at least some predictability for our schools and students over the next year, which might give us a little hope that uh, sh she may not be looking at the, having an emergency for the totality of the next year, but that's still, you know, when, when is she going to give up her, her emergency, emergency powers is still a big question. And we did come together last month also uh, for uh, closing this year's uh, fiscal gap fiscal year gap. And, and so we did work, work through that and uh, find, find savings in the budget uh, while um, using some of the rainy day fund and, uh, and using some federal funds to, to close those budget holes. But we're going to be uh, having to deal with the uh, 2021 budget, which is due by October 1st over the next month. And that's going to be another, another big test for, for us. But I think our larger concern in terms of the legislature and Republicans both is, is the healthy restart of, of Michigan's economy and ending this, this uh, on, unlimited uh, lockdown uh, that the governor has, has implemented over the last several months. I think we were all on board the first few weeks to bend the curve, to make sure our hospitals weren't overwhelmed. Um, fortunately, I know in this part of the state, we didn't see that overwhelming. I know in Southeast, they were pretty close. They, they uh, didn't get over, but they were pretty close. And we've been able to see a drastic uh, flattening of the, of the curve over the last three, three and a half, four months. So The reason why I brought this point up, Eric Nesbitt, is the fact that uh, last, uh, um, you know, about 10 days ago, uh, Joe Biden announced that Kamala Harris was going to be his running mate uh, on the presidential ticket, uh, even though there's, you know, it's been reported that uh, she had asked to be pulled out back in May. Uh, Joe Biden still said, Gretchen Whitmer, you're still on the short list. And she was apparently in the last short list before uh, Senator Harris was selected. Some might say that might be a little change in what the administration might be doing with the legislature and how she's handling the situation. Is, uh, there are those who say that uh, Governor Whitmer's handling of the entire COVID-19 situation was done with one eye on Washington and one eye on Lansing. Do you get a sense that maybe now that she's not going to be the vice presidential uh, running mate, uh, she might be focusing back on Lansing? Maybe as some say she should. I, I sure hope so. I mean, I, I think uh, you need to take um, 
you know, concentrate on the job you have instead of the job you want to have. And I think that's that's something that we need to be reminded of uh, if you're elected leaders in, in the state is that uh, you should be laser focused on the citizens and, and people of Michigan instead of national aspirations. And that's and that's the challenge we've seen in the results here in here in Michigan. We compare ourselves to a similar size state like Ohio. Again, they're about they have about two million more people than than we do. But they, during, you know, they've seen about a third of the per capita deaths that we've seen from COVID. Uh, at the peak of unemployment, they had half the unemployment rate that Michigan had. And they're dealing with a quarter of the budget deficit that Michigan's having to deal with. And so this is the challenge that we have is what science and data is Ohio using to uh, work through uh, this pandemic that Michigan isn't using. And yet um, the, the governor seems to get you know, very high, high praise, but we have the highest death rate in, in the Midwest. And that's that. Those results are, are very troubling when you when you look at the deaths in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. She did it alone on on the nursing homes. There was mass confusion there, forcing them to take COVID-positive uh, patients that that are there. Uh, we've tried to uh, pass legislation. We did pass legislation that she vetoed that would have changed uh, those kind of policies to try to protect the most vulnerable. Because we do know, you know, th those that are most affected that. Uh, could, uh, the highest likelihood of leading to death are older with underlying health conditions that are overweight and, um, and that have a vitamin D deficiency. And we do know that those are leading causes for, for respiratory uh, illnesses. We're talking with State Senator Eric Nesbitt of Lawton. He represents Allegan County in the State Senate. If you have a question for Eric, you can call us at 395-1450, 395-1450. I'm going to throw a question from Late last month, early this month, the state budget director, Chris Kolb, has been reportedly said that there's not enough fat or not enough pork in the current state budget to be able to balance it strictly on cuts and efficiencies. And he has hinted that uh, unless there's help coming from Washington, revenue enhancements is I think the term he used, uh, is going to be needed to, or will be needed to be able to balance the books for fiscal 2021. Obviously, Republicans aren't on board on this particular situation, but can we see some efficiencies done so that there won't be revenue enhancements in order to have a balanced 2021 budget? I don't know what they're talking about in terms of trying to find revenue enhancements when you, you, you've you disallowed people from actually going back to work. When people don't have incomes and aren't spending money, you're not going to see tax revenue. And so but you got to remember, this is the same administration and the same budget director and, and, and Governor Whitmer's administration that a year and a half ago, when times were flush, when the economy was going well, when we had a 4% unemployment rate, when we were dealing with budget surpluses, that they have proposed nearly $3 billion of tax increases. Two and a half billion dollar higher taxes on gasoline, uh, nearly 42 percent increase in terms of uh, taxes on small businesses, and that's and so I think it's a little uh, a little disingenuous saying uh, from the same administration that's been pushing for tax increases uh, when times were going well, uh, when people actually did have some money to spend, and now when times aren't going well, I think this is the last time that we need to see any kind of tax increases is, is when the economy's in a recession and doing this, um, uh, this poorly. I think we need to allow people and challenge the private sector and entrepreneurs and small business owners to get back to work safely, to do it effectively, and to make sure we protect the most vulnerable in, in, our, in our society. And let's get back and, and making sure that people are, uh, are being productive, uh, productive citizens and that we can have the revenue to to fund the priorities of law enforcement and schools and, and, and our roads and, and bridges and our, and our healthcare system. I'm going to ask you a frank question. Maybe you've answered a little bit to a certain extent, Eric. Can Michigan balance its books without getting a, a bailout from Washington on this? Yeah, we can. It'll be tough. I mean, it'll take some tough decisions. And, and uh, But it's something where between the, fis the last 10 years we've been fiscally responsible in the state. We've paid down debt. We've paid down nearly $20 billion worth of long-term debt here in the state. We've increased our savings account from nearly $0 10 years ago to about a billion dollars uh, today. Uh, and, and we have uh, addressed some of these long-term structural issues that we haven't seen and addressed in Illinois or New York or New Jersey or, or California. Uh, 
are we perfect? No, but we're in a lot better position than a lot of other, other states from our fiscally responsible budgeting over the last uh, a decade. And, and it will be, you know, there will be um, some pain if, if we don't see further uh, monies from uh, the, the federal government, but it's something where, as a reminder, um, they're talking trillions, a trillion, two trillion, three trillion dollars out in Washington, D.C. As you do the numbers, if they passed a $90 billion, 90 billion, so a 9% of what the bottom line that they're talking about out there, and they do a per capita outlay to the, to the states, we wouldn't have to make one hard decision this coming fiscal year. Not one. Not one school dollar would be cut, not one local government. And so I think too much of the time we get so carried away with all these uh, uh, political wish lists that are out there instead of saying, let, let's look at what the basic core services that are, that are needed to, to take care of, of, of the citizens in the state. And I don't think there's, and there's going to be long-term consequences for um, spending without any recognition of what this means for uh, our children and our, and our grandchildren and, and the budget deficit and the long-term debt that this is going to leave them. And I know this is an unprecedented time. Hopefully it's another hundred years or even 200 years before we have to deal with a pandemic like this. And hopefully we can do it smarter and, uh, and work through it um, with, uh, I, I think, with a better perspective uh, next time and following the science and data and looking at uh, the, the health effects that just the overall uh, complete economic suppression we saw for, for months. Good morning, you're on Talk of the Town. Oh, good morning, Mr. Stevens. Good morning, Senator Nesbitt. It's another political day here in West Michigan. We don't have any hurricanes, fires, or tornadoes, or floods, but uh, I studied educational psychology years ago at Michigan State. I learned a lot about motivating students. And one thing they had, the idea was to uh, provide money for students when they get A's and B's. It's called earning and learning and so forth. And uh, there's also the concept of a practicum to teach the students practical skills like home economics and mechanics and finance and stuff like that. Could you comment about overhauling the public education system and here in Michigan to help uh, students be more motivated so they can be successful when they graduate and find jobs? Thank you. Thank you very much for the call. Eric? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think we need to continue to you know, look at all options to see what the outcomes are for, for students and, and their learning. I don't, I think too much of the time we look at look at it as institutions, look at it as about being about the adults, whether instead we need to concentrate on what fits well with, with the students. And a lot of that, that's why over the last, you know, several years as I've been in the legislature is, is really trying to concentrate on what kind of uh, pathways is most appropriate for, for the students? How do they learn best? And, um, and, and I think a lot of times we talk about that at the high school level, whether it's dual enrollment with community colleges, whether it's, um, you know, AP uh, courses, whether it's hands-on learning, uh, learning, learning science and technology and, and math through, through, through different ways. I think too much of the time we have a state-focused mandated uh, curriculum that they have to get through, state-mandated, you know, teaching to, to the test. But it's also about at the beginning, at, at uh, kindergarten, first, second, third grade, that elementary school level of making sure that they're prepared for a lifetime of learning, that they have the basics of reading, knowing how to write, knowing how to do math, and knowing how to, how to build up that critical thinking. I think too much of the time we just pass students without having those, those basic uh, foundations. And, and also part of it that is a cultural change and a family change that I don't think the government can you know, really affect greatly, uh, besides staying out of the way a little bit, is the parents and the families in, in the community and making sure that uh, we have strong uh, families and, and strong parents raising uh, children and encourage them and to motivate them and to figure out, you know, what, what, what ways are, are best uh, going in the world. And so that's, that's something where I think long term, you know, how do you, how do you give uh, parents and families the abilities uh, and the choices to, to be able to, um, um, have you know figure out what's best for their for their children because they know them the, the best 
One final thing, Eric Nesbitt, um, State uh, Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson is still uh, uh, angling to try to change Michigan laws so that uh, absentee ballots can be counted earlier than uh, the current laws are at. The Her predecessor as Secretary of State, Ruth Johnson, is a first-term Republican state senator from Holly, uh, against some of the uh, suggestions and some of the proposals that uh, Jocelyn Benson has. Do you see any changes in the election laws between now and November 3rd, or are we still going to have pretty much what we have right now? Well, I mean, Michigan, a, uh, I like the fact that it's all paper ballots. Uh, that's, that's the first thing that I know 20 years ago during the last really, really super close presidential election between George W. Bush and Al Gore, there's a lot of money that went on. Those to, hanging uh, chads. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> 1960s and fifties technology and everything, but I don't mind, you know, but in Michigan, we do have the Scantrons and in those Scantron um, ballots, you have a real paper copy that's, that's there. And having that real paper copy, as long as it's secure, you can, you can figure out that, that recount. I know in Allegan, we just had a really close prosecutor election, and they're, they're, the, uh, the losing candidate may, may be asking for a recount from what I uh, un understand. And you have some real paper ballots that, that are there to recount. Um, and that's same with the, the mail-in. Uh, we've seen, you know, cybersecurity being issued and, and everything else that I, I think that's that's the first thing that's, I think, very important and critical. Number two, I am, and I think you've seen that in some of the more urban areas, is some high-speed counting machines. Because I, I know when you, when I vote, uh, again, I'm in a more rural township, um, you know, we'll probably have, you know, 1,400, 1,500 voters between, you um, you know, the, uh, in the general election this, this fall, probably up from about eight, seven, 800, you know, voters from, from the primary. Uh, but, uh, the voting machine, it's, it usually takes about 30 seconds for it to accept it and count it, which doesn't seem too long when it's just you coming up and, and putting it in, into the machine. But if you're feeding absentee ballots throughout the day, um, you remember the old laser printers that print two pages a minute. Um, and you try to print a hundred page document, it, it feels like eternity. And it is, it, you know, if you're counting a thousand ballots, that, that's going to take quite a while. And so I think you, we need to start looking and concentrating on do some of these higher population areas, do, what kind of funding or needs do they need for high speed uh, ballot counting. I'm, you know, I know a lot of, and a lot of the clerks are having to de deal with and, and change the way they they do a lot of things because the 2018 ballot initiative that was passed where we didn't have day of voter registration and, um, and we didn't, you know, we had to have a reason to vote absentee. Now anybody can vote, vote absentee. Uh, and that is, you know, that is uh, right. That's, that's there um, under, under our state constitution, but we got to just make sure that the elections are secure, that we're able to track these ballots. The people are voting once, uh, per, per time and and that people uh, can can have their ballots actually actually count and I think a lot of things is uh, uh, that the Secretary of State wants to change and unfortunately wants she wants to see delays like we're seeing at the uh, uh, Secretary of State's office when you get your vehicle registered where you have to wait two months to see it and I don't think any of us want to wait two months to see what the election results are and I think you, we should, if, if you're going to vote, you should have your ballot in by 8 p.m. on election day. Yep, we'll see. And, and let's, let's have some certainty and understanding of that our vote counts and that we can count them uh, efficiently and effectively. And whether that's a few more hours past midnight or even, you know, noon the next day, we don't want to see in California where the numbers drastically change over a three-week period mm -hmm. because they're still accepting ballots over Thanksgiving. Eric Nesbitt, as always, we appreciate you joining us. State Senator Eric Nesbitt, look forward to chatting with you again next month. Thank you, Eric. Sounds good. Thanks, Gary.